Cyborg Alpha, Infinite Queen in Middle School for Life. Well, it is 12 hours and 36 minutes into the 11th day of October. It is Canadian Thanksgiving or typically um, Columbus Day. Uh, United, uh, Canada did away with uh, Columbus Day uh, years ago because, of course, you know, uh, there's no significance to Columbus because, well, he discovered uh, uh, the Americas. Uh, <laughs> no, it is it's all because they say they developed, they discovered the America, particularly North America. He actually discovered he actually landed in the Caribbean. So he discovered all of the Americas, and he had thought this was India, but anyway, it, was, it wasn't. So uh, there is a lot of confusion about Columbus, and as uh, uh. Lionel has begun to realize uh, <clears throat> that the world uh, is a lie. It's a lot, you know, that there's a lot of deception out there. I would not say everything is deception, but I would say a fair chunk of it is. And so the question is, the bags, and this is sort of where you're at, your sort of uh, red pill moment number two, if you will. If everything is a lie, is there anything that's true? And the answer is yes. Just because something is presented as a lie, or presented as something else, doesn't necessarily mean that there aren't other understandings of it. It just means that you have to do, do more digging. In other words, there's there's a larger context to what you're actually be, what you're actually seeing, and you have to go find it. This is part of research. Part of research is as, as a researcher, uh, <clears throat> the excitement is going out and finding the new pieces. They're, they're sort of, uh, in many cases at some point, it gets to an obsession where you have to go find the different pieces that are out there. Uh, but the red pill doesn't present itself immediately. It just presents, hey, there's something more outside. And if you don't sort of pick that up and sort of begin to move and realize, okay, yeah, I've been red pill, but there's more to this. You know, this is so called your second red pill. Unless you understand that's a second red pill, and it's right in front of you, then you're not going to accept it. You're not going to move forward in that direction. So it may have nudged you. It may have sort of you may have taken it, but it has no fundamental effect. It's only if you move. Uh, out of your comfort zone, comfort zone enough that you begin to realize that, and this is what the whole thing is, is, is you have Hawkins and others who are the humanists saying there's no reality anymore, there, that the world is typically a hologram, because Things don't sit within their uh, understanding of how things should work, and this is it. They're taking their views, their understanding, saying this is how this is going to work, and when it doesn't work according to their expectations, then there is no reality beyond this. And this is typically the humanist. This is the intellectual approach of things. The approach that was done by Planck, and he was basically, I guess, called the first uh, quantum mechanic, if you will, who understood the world, the universe in not a deterministic fashion, but an undeterministic, a non-deterministic fashion, where you're talking about probability of things that you might understand, or you approach the understanding to. And of course, this brings you back so they say, oh, you're approaching the understanding too. The understanding is a uh, is asymptotic. You can never actually achieve it, but you can have an understanding. You can approach the understanding in the limit. When I say that in the limit, that's the fundamentals of calculus. The whole calculus, the whole series of mathematical calculus, is based on the limit. And it's, it's on this asymptotic curve. 
you want to reach a particular point, but you know you really can't do that because it's, it's infinite in distance. So you can only approach it. And this is the whole issue here is that knowledge isn't to be known. You, you simply approach knowledge. And this causes a problem for a lot of people. If you're a person who is law and order, structure, and so on and so forth, well, the universe isn't going to be very kind to you because it's it, it, you're talking about something that's infinite in nature in terms of its understanding. So you can only approach the understanding. You can never actually ha actually achieve it. And this is why a lot of data scientists actually fail at what they do because... You, you, they don't simply understand. They don't understand that you're simply approaching that knowledge. You don't actually have it. The mathematics, the mathematics may produce a great model in terms of what you see on the computer, in terms of your visual images, the visualization, visualization of the data. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's real. But yet, too many data sides, and this is what we're, the problem we're having today, is they take this data as being real. And this is what Davos, Davos is simply a LARP. It's, it's a live action role play. And this is why they have the scenarios. This is why, in most cases, it just does not work out the way they expect it to work out. Because the knowledge is fundamentally, fundamentally beyond these people. But no one's going to admit this. This is the that there, There's no one who's going to admit that the, the, the information is fundamentally beyond them. This is part of the reality. Uh, anyways, uh, I'm off to my parents' house in a few minutes. My dad is on the way to pick me up. No more scooting for a, little, for a bit. Uh, there's some, uh, hiccups that came into the ride. And the repairs will take close to six months to get everything remedied and, uh, back on the way again. So, but the, in the meantime, uh, uh, it's, uh, rides once again. Looking for rides once again. And that kind of means, uh, well... Uh, I gotta go. <laughs> uh, well, it is uh, 23 hours and 7 minutes, well, 8 minutes now, into the uh, 11th day of October. Uh, it is, uh, thanks well, the end of Thanksgiving for uh, Canada. The end of Columbus Day. And, of course, because uh, the idiots in the, uh, in the government uh, have no clue what history is, uh, me and of uh, Indigenous Day. <laughs> Columbus did not conquer or steal any of the Indian land. He was simply the discoverer. What came next was the Spanish conquistadors that came in and conquered, but they didn't conquer North America. Their con their conquest was primarily uh, 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 the what we now call the Caribbean and southwards into South America. This is why uh, uh, South America is also known as Latin America. This is where Columbus primarily was. It wasn't until later years that you actually had the uh, the evolution of called North America, and Canada itself didn't come into existence until until uh, the 1800s under the uh, British North America Act. This is the actual history of it. You can go take a look at this. But, of course, none of this actually matters to a person who doesn't believe in anything anyways. You know, this, this is the way liberals are. They have no fundamental beliefs. They have no particular uh, understanding of anything. So anything goes. You know, you know, believe what you want to believe. You know, uh, LSD trips are fine. You know, um, uh, the trips on psil uh, psilocybin are good, too. And, you know. Uh, everything's all hunky dory. Everything's all you know. It's all good, uh, as the phrase goes. It's all good. It's all good, man. It's all good. Well, anyways, just because it's all you feel that it's all good does not necessarily mean that you're woke. Uh, accepting everything as you know as equal as sort of non consequential. You know, hey, you're on fire. It's all good. It's all good. It's all good. You're gonna get hit by that car. It's all good. It's all good. It's all good. It's all good. It really depends on where your position is. It's wherever you know you. It's happening to you. If it's happening to you, the bad things. It's not all good. It's all not all good. 
And when it's the bad things that happen to other people, it's all good, it's all good, it's all good. In other words, it's a situation of complete selfishness. And this is what most of the vegans uh, that I know of, I've seen, and I've seen also uh, the ones who are <clears throat> parading around on the internet. Ooh. And this is one thing Lionel doesn't consider, and he, he, he's at another red pill moment. He's at a, red, a moment where he could be red pill. But it really depends on whether you actually step outside your or own orbit. The red pill has more to do with how you see yourself than anything else. The more you can stand outside your own self, your own beliefs, your own understanding of things, and sort of think of things that, are, that, that, that maybe you really never have thought of before in terms of, even in terms of how you observe things. Uh, this changes your perspective. As your perspective changes, so does your understanding. This is the red pill moment. Uh, but, of course, if you're just going to use the the movie, term, movie terminology, this is for those who only understand the movie terminology, then uh, there's only one red, pill, one red pill moment, or you have to use the red pill as multiple mom moments, you know, throughout, the, throughout your travels outside of basically yourself. Uh, you have to consider other people's perspectives. And when I'm looking at most of the vegans, uh, and they're all over the internet. There's a, a number of people you can sort of take a look at and see. And uh, all you have to do is, uh, you know, type into uh, on Instagram, type in vegan, do a, 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 a hashtag vegan. Uh, you can do that on Instagram. You can do that on YouTube. Uh, and look at who they are. And you begin to realize that there is a type of person who becomes a vegan. They're typically middle to upper middle class. They have no necessity for food. They're not, they're not starving. And they consider themselves to be, and this is in many cases, they are the so-called the, the new intellectual class. Uh, Lionel LeBron was the old intellectual class. He was from an era, a, a bygone era that's sort of disappearing very quickly as the so-called woke realized that the old guard was more or less racist and so on and so forth. And uh, well, this is the new uh, intellectual class. But the new intellectual class really doesn't know much anything more than the actually old one did. It just, the, the pretenses are about the same in terms of their actual knowledge of what's going on. And so you see a lot of what called the, the so-called signaling, the sort of what, what uh, Lionel calls the virtue signaling. And what it is, is, is again, it's the pretense. It's, it's, this, the, pretend, it's the, the pretend image. It's the self-image that is projected to others. And this is what veganism is about. It's about your self-projection. It's about how others see you. And it, it is a work. It, it is a creation that is not fundamentally real, but you create it as a you create it as your reality. And this is difficult to under, understand for a lot of people is that people have their own sense of reality. So a person who says, "Oh, I'm a communist." to the chagrin of uh, someone like Lionel LeBron, well, that person may believe that they're a communist and they're doing something in the name of communism. Go to check around every now, once now, every now and again for skunks. Because they're out and about. Mm-hmm. I said that. And... and unless you consider someone's, someone's perspective, you only consider your perspective to be the fundamental reality. And I'm not gonna I'm not gonna argue with the person who says they're communist because look, if that's what you believe, then fine. But at the same time, is I'm also not gonna argue with a humanist either, because humanists don't always necessarily have to be communists. There's a whole spectrum of humanists, just as there's a whole spectrum of communists. Even though communism sits within the humanistic sphere, I call them spheres, uh, from the uh, flattened two 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 dimensional. Uh, view there looked at, looked at, looked at as circles. This is where you get the Venn diagram, and so there are certain there could be certain areas of overlap and sort of mutual interest or mutual uh, existence, if you will. And if a person wants to believe something or, have, or, or, or are let's say trapped within that sphere, I can see they're trapped in the sphere, but they can't. So a person who calls themselves a communist sees himself as a communist. 
and their actions are taken in this in this particular sense. And this is what Dostoevsky writes about. We're we'll talking with my dad over the weekend. It, 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 it's amazing how Dostoevsky really got this whole thing about humanism right. His descriptions from uh, Brothers Karamazov all the way through to uh, you know through uh, the idiot, the possessed, and then uh, uh, crime and punishment really hits the nail on the head. It really does. Uh, provide a presentation, and this was done in the late 1800s, so, you know, enough time before our current year, so, oh, well, no, this has never been predicted. Well, here it is here. <laughs> in the 1800s, let's give it 200 years before, uh, before our understanding, before these events, these current events, and here's someone writing about what's happening. Because it was, and here's the thing that Lionel says, this has never happened in the United States before. True. But it's happened in the world before. And this is the problem that, again, his opponent would be Yvette Carnell. She was one of the people who, the, the strong, strong proponents for uh, uh, reparations for, for what she called ADOS. And ADOS were the original, you know, the, these are the descendants of slave owners, uh, or, or of slaves, actually, I should say, the descendants of slaves who are all these reparations. Yeah, this was taken, used, used politically, and then after everything was all said and done, she was kind of pushed to the side, and, you know, left, left behind, if you will. And she wasn't included in the party. And this was, you know, you could see this sort of kind of uh, irked her, sort of, you know, she did all this work, got the message out, and then at the end of the day, because she wasn't recognized for it, uh, there was sort of, and, and there was no real reparations. Uh, the people in the upper level got the reparations, but of course, this is the way it is even within, within the Charities for Africa. Oh, I helped out. I gave all the candies to, uh, from Halloween to uh, a, a group that gives, that gives them to Africa. They send them to children to Africa who don't have Halloween there. They don't have this type of candy. Well, this is kind of a mythology <laughs> And the people who do this will actually believe in what they're doing. They're doing something good. They're doing something charitable without necessarily checking in to say, well, is the candy actually getting to the kids? Are the kids in Africa actually having this instead of Halloween? You know, you know, as their Halloween type of thing. And more often than likely not, it, 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 goes, it, it goes into the charity, into the garbage, or someone takes it home with them. And the kids in Africa get nothing. Why? Because... And this is this is what, the way it was with Live Aid. This is with, with a lot of different things. What you have, let me just adjust my camera here for a bit. What you have in a lot of these charities are people who are going to serve themselves first. And so, what happens? You give ten dollars to a charity. That charity will take ninety. The, it will take nine dollars out of the ten dollars you gave, and use it for administrative purposes. And so they'll pass on maybe ten dollars, ten percent, uh, to another charity, another organization who will get it to Africa. So they're not the ones actually in Africa doing it. They send it to another group who's going to get this done in Africa. Well, that group is going to take another ninety percent for themselves, you know, the administrative fees, and only give past ten percent on. So you're giving, you're giving, you know, you take that ten dollars became one dollar, that one dollar becomes one that one dollar becomes ten cents. So what what gets to Africa is ten cents for the average person. Of a, of the ten dollars that you gave. This is the way charities work. This is the way it's done for medical science, for all these sort of cures, run for the cure of this, run for the cure for this, run for the cure for that, uh, show your support for this show your support for that, and all these different things, you know, the, the Elizabeth Glazier Foundation, all these different foundations, they're there to make people rich. They make their, and it's, it's how the rich hide their money in taxes, because all this stuff, all these charitable foundations are tax-free. They're, they're tax-exempt. And so if you want to, you want to say, oh, my secretary is getting more than I am, paying more in taxes than I am, yeah, because You've exempted most of your money through these different foundations. 
You fly in on the expense of the foundation. You have your cars leased under the foundation. So everything there is tax exempt. Tax exempt. And if you, you've pulled yourself out of the tax loop. If you want to give more, give more. But they're not going to do that because they have no intention of ever paying these taxes. They're just saying this because this is what sounds good in the public. And most of the public buys it. No one questions the, 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 the actual effect of what's going on. And because everyone sort of lives in this sort of self-engrandizing environment where, where the self is the most important thing, you can't argue with someone who has this fun, fundamental belief of, I'm a communist, I'm a this, I'm a that. I'm a good person because I don't know, donate to here. Oh, th- this person shouldn't have X amount of money because, you know, what about the poor people? You know, and the thing is, they're not going to give money of their own own free will. They're going to buy and have whatever they want to have. You know, someone else does their, their you know, <laughs> women are like this, but guys like to a certain degree. Guys will do, this guy has a car, I need to have that car. Girls will say, oh, someone redid their living room. I want that living room. And they'll, they'll go into debt to get that living room or they'll borrow from their parents to get to that, that living room. It's not because they need something. It's because they want something. And they live in a fundamentally selfish world. And this is why you, get a, why you have all the line that Lionel doesn't like because everyone's out there for themselves. There is very little in many cases that, that people are selfless. This understanding is really isn't there. So the question is, is, is Lionel going to be red-pilled at all in, the, in terms of the second red pill? I doubt it because I listened to his, his, his thing today. I listened to his, I look following his uh, tweets now too as well. And he's stuck on the same thing. He really can't get outside of himself. He does try to look, he is fascinated by this. Uh, other other different perspectives, but he doesn't seem to know how to internalize it. He has a hard time with that. But again, he's having a hard time getting outside of himself. So, anyways, uh, this is it for now. Uh, we will be doing more on the inside, so we'll be getting more of this in sort of the uh, our life as cyborg alpha. Uh, what's going to be happening is that eventually the uh, the road vlog is going to end. We're still uh, back. We're still posting the back date ones. Uh, there are audio issues with the uh, the road vlog, so I'm repeating some of the stuff in here. But eventually, they'll come out to the uh, the the observation vlog, and then from the observation vlog, things will evolve as we talk about gnosis. Uh, that will evolve into its own uh, uh, type of vlog that will uh, go up on YouTube as well, and I'll sort of post the uh, the links and the information. Uh, as we uh, move along. Anyways, uh, I'll see you. This is it for this transition. I'll see you on the inside when we begin our YouTube stroll in uh, about an uh, hour, hour and a half. While it is 23 hours and uh, 12 minutes into the 12th day of October 2021, and the uh, we are getting closer with our uh, our life as Cyborg Alpha vlog. This is our notes. This is where the notes are. The road vlog uh, uh, was, past tense was, our essay. Uh, the, uh, the vlog you're seeing now are the notes. Sometimes there's a long entry to the notes because sometimes things do have to be explained. There's a lot of detail that has to be placed into the notes. But nonetheless, these are our notes. The, the, and it, the essays were always the first draft essay, so there are flubs, there are mistakes in there. There are a, a lot of things that need to go back. You need to go back up and clean up and sort of uh, polish up a little bit. Uh, that being said, as I uh, I did the my Lionel uh, uh, perusal today, and one of the things I was talking about uh, is Lionel's placement in the intellectual spectrum, because there's a lot. Of, again, there's always this, there isn't one type of person. There's always a lot of different types of people, and it really depends on how what your perspective is on how the person sort of interacts with others. My nose is itchy. Excuse me. Uh, 
live mistakes, not not edited out. Uh, they're often called one takes, but in in the research journal, all mistakes need to be left in. All sort of issues that occur uh, occur unedited, if you will. Un you don't edit them out. Uh, so the player trying to play Lionel. Lionel has it, it gives you sort of a thought of an, inte an intellectual. You can start now start defining the intellectual spectrum. He was talking about uh, some of the interviews he's been watching on C-SPAN two and. A number of these other called they're slow channels. They're not necessarily your popular channels because there's an there is a significant amount of there's a significant amount of depth to them in terms of a possible depth, not actually there itself. It really depends on 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 what the topic is, who's speaking on it, and in many cases, if they're being interviewed, it depends on the interview. The interviewer. In many cases, the, old, the, the the newer interviewers really don't have enough of a historical background. They don't have enough knowledge to really be doing a serious interview. So it's it's more that you ignore the sort of the 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 interviewer and pay more attention to the author being interviewed. And it's not that difficult to do once you, once you get enough practice that you can sort of ignore. The various different factors that will sort of, sort of cause the other side to be not so pleasant uh, and to listen to, and so you simply learn to tune it out and listen to what the author has to say, and more particularly listen to the uh, and, and observe the author's reaction to what's going on. Uh, this is what becomes more significant uh, as you sort of bring more and more of your notes in. And I was looking at this because he was trying to start talking about these intellectuals, and these are along the lines of David Brinkley Jr. And it's, you know, these are it's the old PBS crowd. The old PBS there is a distinction between the old PBS crowd and the new PBS crowd. The old PBS crowd had an understanding of history, where the different uh, parts of culture came from, particularly Shakespearean plays and so on and so forth. There's a plane coming overhead. One of the things I'm able to do is this is a side tangent as a plane comes over. One of the uh, things I can do here while I'm sitting here is I can see the clouds from here. And I can also see the planes. There's a flight path along my way from uh, right, from my right to my left. The left is west. That's where Pearson Air Airport is, the major international airport for Toronto. And this is the approach path, the planes uh, approach at a significantly low altitude because they're approaching the runway. But there are other planes that cross at a higher altitude. And once you get to know the altitudes of the planes, and you can sort of do this on the, on the Internet, as you get the altitudes of the plane, you can then figure out what the altitudes, the probable altitudes, would be for the clouds. So right now the plane is crossing over. The clouds are above, so I'm looking at a, probably, more likely not, I'm looking at a, either a, 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 a second layer atmosphere cloud. These are the clouds that are sort of coming through. So it gives me a way of judging what comes through. Typically your rain clouds, if they're gonna be immediate rain clouds, are down low, I mean, low enough so that when the plane is flying overhead, you don't see them because they're in the clouds. And at a certain point in time, when the clouds get thick enough at the level where the plane is in the cloud and they're closer to the ground, uh, the flight path stops because the uh, landing ability, the, the seeing is zero, and they stop flights from coming in because it is zero. So, but anyways, back to the uh, back to the the intellectual spectrum. There is a pretense to all intellectuals. All intellectuals have a pretense. The ones who tend to be on the older end of things will always refer back to things like Shakespeare. Oh, some of the older plays like Chekhov. They, uh, um, they even go back to Dostoevsky. They have an uh, they'll have a, a a good historical understanding. The younger ones, uh, typically, they're about thirty, maybe into their forties now, who have absolutely no understanding of history. And Lionel sort of seems to sit in that that range, 
where the where he is not with the old, but he's also not with the new because he's about he's about uh, sixty five years old. He's a few years older than I am, and uh, so he in, sits in that at that at the point where the uh, it, I was sort of the last class, if you will, that had was presented with uh, some degree of culture, some degree of history. Uh, but much of it, I had to sort of pick up on my own. A lot of it was my own sort of in my own uh, interests that I followed along. Uh, not necessarily, it didn't have necessarily have to do with my schooling. But those who were sort of left to their own devices, which became the next generation that produced the 90s, uh, had no sense of history. They had no contact with history. And this is kind of what you're seeing uh, You're seeing now is that you hear the phrase, oh, that was before I was born. And that tells you the person has no contact, contact with history. They have no understanding of history beyond their immediate experience. And this is important. This has a significance because... The sense of self, where you sit in an intellectual spectrum, depends on your experience. A person who understands history has been able to take take his own position and expand the experience in his own position out to older periods of time. Uh, they may not be complete, but they can be nonetheless there to a sufficient point where they become functional. In other words, you can use them within a conversation. Uh, there is some stuff that just really remains book knowledge and never comes up ever again. You memorize it, you put it down on the desk, and, and away it goes, and you never remember it. But there are things that do stick with you. And Beyond that, you have people who will, in these social, social arrangements and social gatherings, will sort of pick out they'll sort of divide along certain lines. The majority of the people will simply repeat what they've heard. They will never question what they've heard, but they repeat what they've heard. The, those are your basically your parrot intellectuals. And these guys, have, these, these parrot intellectuals, have always been around on both sides. They're the ones who use pretense. They're the ones who are pretentious. And they think they're better than everybody else. And they will never consider somebody else's opinion or views other than their own. A conflicted, a conflicted intellectual is a person who does have a sense of self. But every once in a while is going, hmm, am I sure about that? And is willing to investigate more and will, will in some ways change their position. They'll never acknowledge the change in position, but they will indeed change their position. Uh, this is what I see. Lionel, Lionel typically, when he changes his position, particularly initially, will never say that he's changing his position. It's not until much later on where he's more comfortable with, with the change in position, he come and say, oh, yeah, I changed my position. And this is a person who is thinking about something. This is a person who you can sort of, if you watch enough, you can see the conflict. You can see uh, the sort of the conflict between the various different ideas uh, and his sort of decision to go one way or another, and this is why you sort of, if you watch thing you watch or do the observation long enough, as I've done with Lionel, Lionel as our object that we're observing, and you watch long enough, then you begin to get a sense of who Lionel is, and once you have understand that in terms of the personality. You can then go and start saying, say, well, well, why does he think what he thinks? And you'll see that in his personality, a lot of his personality, a lot of his experiences bring out his understanding of why he thinks the way he thinks. And this is sort of in terms of QLARP, in terms of creating that influence, this is what you have to have, this understanding before you start, instead of, like, he's talking about people who send him email, or, you, know, try, you know, trying to be part of the conversation. Well, yes and no, because I send them emails, but I don't send them the emails to become part of the conversation. These are more of uh, these are inquis uh, uh, these are more in in uh, sort of inquis uh, 
I don't know how to say this. Say this. It's not inquisition or or inquisitory or, or anything like that. This is sort of the only analogy I come up with is throwing pebbles in a, in, 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 a, in a pond or water. And you look at the ripples that come out. And it's more about curiosity than anything else. It's not You're not trying to make a statement. So every once in a while, and I've done this for a while, you throw articles uh, at Lionel, sort of email them articles, not to tell them what I know, but it's a pebble. I want to see how he's going to react to it. I want to see what his his sort of, <laughs> if you will, I want to see the ripples in the pond. So, and, and nothing more than that. And so sometimes you throw him a pebble, he does nothing. Other times you throw him a pebble, he, he sort of jounces his back and forth or sort of uh, waffles about things. Uh, there are some sort of, if you will, perturbations where he's perturbed about certain things. You can see this particularly within some of the emails. Uh, you can see that uh, over the last few days, if you look at the, what his titles were and, and how things ended up going, that uh, uh, he just sort of got to a point where it was too much and he just sort of had to back off and take a few days off and come back at it fresh again. And that happens. You, you, there are times where you get just too, tar- too tired to deal with all the crap that goes on. And it, it, it doesn't end. There is no real end to things. And the thing is, you, you can't sort of identify exactly who the who the deep state is, because there isn't one single point that is the deep state. There are several different points, and more often than not, they're not always in agreement with, with each other. There's a lot of conflict up in the deep state, but that's neither here nor there. And uh, uh, the observation is. Going to come to the end very soon, and so I'll probably finish that out here. And then within about a half hour, forty-five minutes, I'll go inside and uh, transition to the uh, YouTube stroll, and that will bring us into Wednesday. And then Wednesday will be my day off where I can sort of sleep all day. So that's where we're at right now. <laughs> we are Cyborg Alpha. Infinite Queen in Middle School for Life.